Hello and welcome to the first meeting of the Citizens Monetary Policy Committee. This is a special initiative by CNBC TV18. This committee will be chaired by Dr. Pranab Sen, former advisor to the Planning Commission, former Chief Statistician of India. The members of this committee include some of India's top economists, Sonal Varma of Namura, Soumya Kanti Ghosh of State Bank of India, Sajid Chinoy of JP Morgan and Samiran Chakraborty of Citibank. The role of this committee is to shadow the Reserve Bank's policy-making machine, be it the internal policy-making machine or the proposed Monetary Policy Committee. This Monetary Policy Committee, the Citizens Committee, will meet on the eve of every monetary policy announcement to evaluate the macroeconomic environment and advise the Reserve Bank on what its policy stance ought to be. Its maiden meeting starts now, this very second, with Dr. Pranab Sen on the chair. Well, uh, let me welcome all of you, gentlemen and lady, and straight away go to the chairman, uh, uh, Dr. Pranab Sen. Dr. Sen, uh, first up, sir, how would you analyze the growth and the infl uh, uh, inflation trajectory in which the policy is going to be framed? Uh, do you think growth desperately needs help? Or do you think inflation at the moment uh, uh, is at a, s a stage where it can afford another cut? Um, well, frankly, you know, you've put me on a spot mm -hmm. um, because as a committee, I think this is something we need to discuss. We'll have very different perspectives mm -hmm. on both the growth and the inflation stories. Mm -hmm. Now, insofar as I am concerned, I frankly don't think uh, growth needs any real help at particularly this point in time uh, from the monetary policy side. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as inflation is concerned, Although I think uh, because of the, the reports on the monsoon, uh, there are expectations that uh, the uh, price pressures would be, would be muted. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, you know, there, there's still some time to go before the effects of the monsoon are really felt. Mm. And in the interim, in the short run, there can be price pressures uh, which we may have to be a little wary about. Okay, Dr. Sen, I'll come uh, to you once again uh, to also assess the international scenario, uh, which has uh, quite a few ambushes on the way. But uh, uh, let me get to the other members. Uh, Samiran, how do you assess uh, uh, the macroeconomic situation uh, in the country, uh, especially the inflation scenario? Uh, do you see the RBI's estimate of 4.9 to 5% by January 2017 being at risk? Uh, in our view, the positive news on inflation front is that, one, uh, the monsoon forecast has been uh, normal. In fact, the second positive news is that the MSP increase, even for this year, has been pretty benign. Uh, so both these factors, as well as the general deflationary process that has been continuing on the food inflation front for a while now, uh, should make sure that food inflation uh, over the summer uh, stays uh, relatively benign and that's what gives us some kind of a comfort that RBI should be able to meet its uh, January 2017 uh, inflation target, in fact could be a tad below that. However, off late uh, some of the upside risks have uh, shown up. Uh, one of them is that global commodity prices are up about 10-15 percent from their April lows, in particular sugar is up almost 30 percent. Uh, the other risk that we are seeing is that core inflation is very persistent and on top of it, the GDP data sh is showing a huge divergence between consumption growth and investment growth, which could become inflationary at some point of time. And we obviously still don't know when the seventh pay commission impact is going to come and there are some base effect related distortions around July, August. So keeping all this in mind, uh, the tone of RBI would be very interesting that whether they are seeing upside risks to their inflation forecasts. At this moment, we think the risks are pretty much balanced and uh, that's why we want to see how inflation progresses for the next two, three months, particularly on the food inflation front uh, and, and then take a call after that. Okay. Well, uh, that's interesting. I'll uh, come back to you for uh, the domestic liquidity assessment as well. But, uh, uh, Sajid, uh, uh, you know, taking off from what uh, Shabiran is saying, uh, he says the risks are balanced. 
but clearly we have seen food inflation uh, you know go higher uh, i'm not terribly worried about the global commodity prices just yet but correct me anyway they didn't get passed on so much uh, would you worry that 4.95% in jan is at risk do you see that rbi's fan chart getting shifted upward at all I think it's a bit premature to say the fan chart itself will shift to this policy, but I think any downside risk that existed back in February, March, April have kind of disappeared right now. Remember, the RBI's forecast for oil in this year is forty dollars. Mm. At fifty, we're already you know uh, twenty percent, twenty-five percent above that forecast, and the RBI itself estimates for every ten dollar increase above the forecast, you're looking at a twenty, thirty basis point increase in headline CPI. So I think for starters, oil prices have moved up beyond what the RBI thought they would. Secondly, they had forecasted inflation to be around 5%, they said, with interquarter variations. April was at 5.4. We suspect May is going to be close to 5.4. June could be 5.5. So at least in the, in the first quarter of the fiscal year, you could be 40, 50 basis points above mm. what the RBI had thought it would. Mm. All this does is raise the bar for, for what the monsoon has to do. Now, let's be clear here. There's no direct easy correlation mm -hmm. between normal and strong monsoons and food prices. But, you know, starting conditions matter. You're coming off two successive droughts. Uh, so there'll be various factors at play. What needs to happen? is food prices need to go or food inflation needs to go down later in the year to offset any increase from oil or commodities and ensure that we're at the 5% mark. So I'd, I'd conclude by saying the margin for error that the RBI thought perhaps existed two, three months ago with commodities, oil at 30, has clearly evaporated. Uh, it's going to be much, much more, much closer than we thought, which means the space for any easing down the road, if any existed, is, is much more limited at this point in time. And therefore, I continue to believe the focus this year will be much more on transmission making sure past policy rate cuts get pushed into market market prices, bank rates, rather than you know much more easing from now on. Oh, so I will be coming back to you all with uh, liquidity questions. Uh, uh, I'll come to the lady last because I expect that will be a very effective argument. So now to Xiaomi, uh, representing uh, the biggest bank in the country. Xiaomi, you know, Dr. Sen started by saying that growth really doesn't need monetary policy help at this point in time. I will come back to him uh, to flush out that statement. But what is your sense as uh, representing the biggest bank as well? Uh, can uh, Is growth so, uh, in such a situation that it needs uh, 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 monetary policy help? No, I think I uh, broadly tend to agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Sen said in terms of the growth. If you, if I go purely by the growth numbers, mm. I think as of now the monetary policy doesn't warrant any action. Even though they're on the on the ground, the scenario is a little bit different because things are picking up, but not picking up at the pace where the data suggests. So that is regarding the growth. Regarding the inflation trajectory, I think I tend to differ a little bit because yes. There are upside risks to the inflation projections which has appeared since the RBI did the last assessment. But here is an interesting proposition if you actually go through the data. The current increase in oil prices, if you break it up into two halves, the first half of the fiscal, uh, the calendar year and the second half of the calendar year, and if you go through the last two years data, you will always find that the oil prices tend to rally in the first half and that rally actually subsides significantly in the second half. So if that is the case, and given the fact that the, uh, the I mean, uh, the U.S. growth, the uh, employment numbers which came in recently were not that strong, mm. I have a feeling and that the oil prices could actually go down from that level. Okay. So if that is the case, then the upside risk which you are talking about in terms of the commodity prices may not be that significant, and that would continue to exact a little bit downside impact on the inflation numbers. Oh, so you expect the inflation number to be at 4.9 Jan 17th, uh, Jan 2017, uh, uh, Shomyo? Yeah, I think as of now, even though the risk have, there is a little bit of elevated risk, but I think RBI is comfortably placed in reaching the 5% inflation target as on FY17. Okay. Because please remember, as far as the food prices is concerned, there is a big elephant which is the pulses, okay. and which had contributed 100 basis points. Okay. All right. Uh, well, uh, let me come to uh, Sonal. Uh, Sonal, uh, uh, two questions to you because we may not have time uh, to uh, come back to you on that. Your inflation uh, uh, trajectory, uh, is RBI's uh, trajectory in danger or are the risks balanced? And more importantly, how much do you think the Reserve Bank is going to concentrate on transmission? Uh, therefore, your thoughts on the liquidity scenario.
Sure. So, uh, on inflation, actually, I think uh, most of the factors that drove disinflation are behind us. I mean, we keep obsessing about month-on-month -month numbers and, you know, towards the end of the year, base effects are positive and therefore YOY inflation will come down. But for the last 18 months, we have not seen any disinflation. And basically, there are three, four factors that have driven disinflation, you know, minimum support prices coming down, rural wages coming down, output gap being negative, oil prices coming down, and all these factors have already played their role. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there aren't very clear factors that are that look like will incrementally add to disinflation uh, going forward. And therefore, uh, as far as the RBS trajectory is concerned, we are broadly on track to meet 5% uh, uh, by March 2017. With risk to the upside, uh, once the pay commission uh, clearly gets uh, implemented, and uh, you know, absolutely no correlation between monsoon rainfall and uh, food inflation. We've seen that in 2009-10. We've seen that in 2002-04, when despite bad monsoons, food inflation was low, and we've seen it in the last two years, where you know, despite bad monsoons, inflation has remained uh, quite subdued. So I think the expectation that because monsoons will be better, food inflation will come down may not necessarily hold true and the moderation we are expecting on inflation is purely on transitory base effect factors underlying there is no disinflation so uh, on inflation on target with some risks on the upside um, I, you know the big focus uh, uh, and which is what you mentioned has to be on transmission uh, base rates at nine and a half percent with repo rate at six and a half percent or even if you look at the one year table rate which is the risk free lending at mm. seven percent a two and a half percent uh, kind of a risk premium is extremely high by historical standards mm. now whether that's because of liquidity conditions which RBI said they're going to tackle and they have been tackling or it's because banks Banks uh, are just, you know, tightening the lending standards because of the NPA issue. I think the focus now from a, from a purely growth inflation dynamic perspective, you know, we are where we should be on the repo rate. Mm -hmm. The focus has to be on how to compress the risk premium going forward mm -hmm. uh, through policy actions, whether liquidity or could be more regulatory issues with respect to NP, etc. But that is where the bang for the buck has to come from uh, going forward. Well, I want to get the others as well on the liquidity issue and whether the Reserve Bank, you know, there's no point in cutting rates if anyway it's not getting transmitted is an argument. But before that, we, are, we have not tackled another big elephant in the room, which is the global scenario. Uh, Dr. Sen, uh, what should the Reserve Bank worry about? Uh, and from now to the remaining part of this calendar, uh, do you think the global scenario is going to give the, government, the Reserve Bank much elbow room to cut rates? Well, it's not a question of rates at this stage. The, the real question uh, that I think should exercise the Reserve Bank is what is the stance that you take on liquidity? Mm. Because the likelihood in terms of the global developments is not so much a rate issue. Mm. Uh, it's not the question of trying to retain funds mm. uh, within the country. It's much more that if an outflow is inevitable, mm. how do you look at the, the liquidity consequences of, of this, these events? Mm. And, that's, and they have to be prepared for that because the, the kind of changes that can happen can be fairly sharp. Mm. and you know you may be caught napping mm. unless you're you're already prepared for it and that really i think is the big issue it's uh, keeping your weapons oiled mm. no i take your point sir and uh, uh, that is the unexpected outflow that you fear if there is a, a tremor in the global financial markets in the event of a rate uh, hike by the fed or in the event of uh, china uh, introducing some instability but actually there is a known outflow uh, in September, October of $30 billion and the Reserve Bank has to prepare the monetary system for that as well. All those questions uh, to our committee after this very short break to stay with us.